Good afternoon. My name is Steve Dukin. I'm the Managing Director of the School of Industrial Engineering, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the uh, 2017 Moshe Barash Memorial Lecture. Uh, I'd also like to recognize Eel Barash, Eel, and his family. Um, we're very happy that you could join us today. Uh, we are not, unfortunately, uh, blessed by having Sonia Barash here. She passed away this year. Sonia was uh, Moshe's uh, wife and woman's I thought so with her. The Brosh Lecture Endowment was established in memory of the late Ransburg Professor Emeritus of Industrial Engineering, Moshe Barash, uh, a leader in the field of manufacturing science and, and engineering for nearly 50 years. Uh, he passed away in 2006. Uh, Moshe made significant contributions to our understanding of manufacturing processes, precision engineering, and manufacturing systems. But he was probably best known for his pioneering research on computers in the factory of the future. Moshe was also known for his encyclopedic memory and knowledge about uh, almost any topic under the sun using his curiosity and his curiosity, both of which uh, enabled him to create beautiful patterns in his research by connecting the dots that others could not do. It's that pioneering spirit, so much a part of Moshe's approach to research, that we've chosen to make the hallmark of the Moshe and Barash Memorial Lectures. It's our goal not only to invite some of today's best minds and thinkers, uh, but specifically invite those who are out of the box thinkers who look at the world in new ways and who are connecting patterns that others don't see. And we certainly have that with our speaker today for Dr. Professor Lyme Cooler joined the Purdue faculty in 1961 after graduating from John Hopkins. Hopkins. At Purdue, he taught courses in operations research and engineering economics. He was head of the school in industrial engineering from 69 to 74, which is my vintage. Uh, and from 81 to 93. A third was actually my academic advisor. Uh, in 1980, he was the organizing director of Purdue's Computer Integrated Design Manufacturing and Automation Center. And from 93 to 2000, he directed the Purdue's Technical Assistance Program. He led students of the operations, of, he led studies of the operations research libraries in the, for NSF from 1962 to 1985, and was a distinct, distinguished lecturer for the American Library Association. Lastly, his book, An Enduring Quest, The Story of Purdue Industrial Engineers, was published by Purdue University Press in 2009, and we use it today in our, in our curriculum. Please welcome Dr. Ferdinand Thank you. Well, I'm not a practice as a lecturer, but the last lecture I gave must have been like in know, maybe 1999 or something like that. So, uh, but there are there are people here in this audience who heard me lecture back then. <laughs> I never had this kind of show, of course, when I lectured. It's extremely rare for another professor to go to another professor's lecture, and to have a bunch of them here is an honor, really, to have that. Uh, so I hope I can live up to the expectations here. And I, I, I want to talk about Moshe Barash, who was a very good friend of mine. Uh, he, uh, at first, to get to know each other it was a bit difficult. Because Moshe came from England, from Manchester, where he, he got his degree in mechanical engineering. And here, he was always sort of moving towards the mechanical engineers. He felt a little out of place in, uh, in industrial engineering. And so he stayed in, mostly in Michael Golden Lab, teaching courses in hard manufacturing, cutting metal, things like that. I was an, really from Johns Hopkins, and I was really like an applied mathematician, teaching operations research and economics uh, in Grissom. So our paths didn't cross. Two different, very different areas. but. At the end of both of our stays here, we were on the same research project, collaborating, talking with each other intimately, and working together. And my talk is really about how our paths crossed, why that happened, 
because it was really rather spectacular that we could come together. But it wasn't just us. It happened throughout the university. It really happened throughout the technical world, that kind of convergence. Okay? And that's really the essence of my talk. So I want to, now I've written this out to keep myself on track because I tend to get off on, you know, excursions. Which, so Natalie's going to show slides to keep me on track too, okay? Hopefully, uh, with my wife Natalie, I should introduce her. Patient Natalie, so. Well, this story that I'm going to tell you really began like 400 years ago. 400 years ago. Anyhow, 1500, how about that? That's 500. It really began with a guy named Leonardo da Vinci, I think. Maybe you know about Leonardo. Leonardo is considered one of the greatest artists of all. He painted two of the most famous paintings in the world. Mona Lisa, you know? Just recently in the New York, today in the New York Times, they discovered a third painting, another painting by him. They just auctioned it off for $400 million. How about that for one painting? I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. It's extravagant. It's insane in a way. Okay? Half a billion dollars for one painting? That's the guy I want to start with. Because in a very recent biography just came out, the, the author says, Leonardo really thought of himself more as an engineer and a scientist than as a painter, which is kind of extraordinary in a way when you think about it. But if you read about Leonardo, you'll see why. He, oh, there, there, Leonardo. There's a machine he invented. He was working with Niccolo uh, Machiavelli. Do you know that name? Another famous Florentine. The two of them were working on how to dig a canal so they could divert the Arno River. And Machiavelli really engaged uh, Leonardo, who was a young guy then. Well, he's you know, like 30, I guess. But anyhow, to, to come and help him do this. So the question was, What's it practical to dig a canal? And Leonardo made a very careful motion and time study of digging. He studied people digging. He found out the best motions. To, he, he, this is all he kept detailed notes of his work, of how to dig, how many motions to take, so he got the proper way to dig. Then he timed guys, and he decided, he finally determined that a good, able worker using a shovel that held 10 pounds of dirt, could move two and a half tons of dirt in an hour. <coughs> Sounds a lot, a lot, but that's what he figured. That was the standard. So then he figured out what it would take to move, to dig this trench, uh, this, you know, this canal. They decided it was just too long, impractical, so they dropped it. Okay, but it, it's still in his notes what he did. He, also, in connection with that, he invented this, they never built it, this machine to lift dirt from one level to another. The workers would work on a treadmill that would lift the dirt in a bucket. And then the workers would ride the bucket down, would use their weight to reload it. He, so he was a very ingenious guy about things like this. But his notes are full of these kind of engines. And that's why he thought of himself, he was very proud of himself being an inventor. I, I, I urge you to read this latest biography of you have time. Okay. So I really think it's one of the first recorded instances of industrial engineering, because it's true industrial engineering what he did. And that's why I mentioned him. Mm. So that standard of his, two and a half tons, in an hour, reappeared in testimony before the U.S. Congress, believe it, by a guy named Frederick Taylor. Frederick Taylor is another industrial engineer I want to tell you about. <laughs> Taylor was very famous. He, oh, maybe I, I'm departing the notes, but it's okay. Still in your notes. Anyhow, still in your notes. Taylor, he, he came to fame because he reorganized Bethlehem Steel. I mean, the big city of Bethlehem. 
full of steel mills, and he was hired to reorganize it. He did. He made revolutionary discoveries about steel cutting and steel making, which he introduced there. But he also developed a system of management that he called scientific management. Okay. He cut the price of steel in half. It was sensational. At the Paris World's Fair in 1900, they gave him a gold medal for this. And every country, they were getting ready for World War I, you see, and every country was interested in steel. Clemenceau, the, the, the premier of France, the prime minister, ordered French armories to do what, what he did, what Taylor did. E even Lenin in Pravda praised Taylor as something we should maybe look at here in Russia what he did with steel. So that's how famous the guy was. Back here in the States, they hired him to reorganize all of the country's armories and navy yards. A huge contract with his team of people. And he was studying uh, the armories when the unions went on strike. Okay? They said, they can't work with this man. He's impossible. They got Congress to hold hearings about what he was doing in the armories, okay? They held hearings that were sensational, reported in the front pages of the newspapers, and they had Taylor come and testify, explain what he was doing. He said, what I am doing is applying science to the management of the armories. And he said, and as an example, I will show you about my science of shoveling. You see, he called it the science of shoveling. And he showed him this, this graph. He had made repeated experiments, time study experiments, of people shoveling coal and shoveling iron ore in these mills. He varied the shovel load in pounds. Okay? You see 10 pounds there, you see 20, you see 35 pounds. That was a heck of a big shovel, you know? And he tied people what could work and do. And so, see this 10 pound standard here? He did it in, what, uh, pounds per, no, tons per day, he did it, okay. Anyhow, if you break it down, it's that at 10 pounds, 10 pounds show, it, it comes out to two and a half pounds an hour. And so he, he, you see, he really verified Leonardo's estimate, okay? And this is made in, this is done like around 1900, so we're, we've moved ahead quite a bit. But Taylor said, what you see at, with a 20 pound, about a 20 pound shovel, double the shovel weight, I can get a lot more output out of the workers. And in fact, you know, you can double the output just about by doing that. And he said, that's scientific. That's what the science of management will do. And he said, uh, now, he said to, to Congress, unions will not help with this. They have nothing to contribute to this chart. They're not scientists. They do it the way they've always done it. They do it and soldier. They want to do it at a slow pace. So I don't want to work with unions. I don't want anything to do with unions. You know, I can't do my job. Well, Congress pondered this. They ended up siding with the unions. They actually passed laws that outlawed time study in any U.S. facility any federal facility, even post offices, were not allowed. In the po For 35 years, you couldn't do a time study in a U.S. facility because of laws Congress passed. So that's what Taylor accomplished. This, okay? Now, he went on, of course, being very famous. I mean, Harvard started their MBA program specifically to teach his methods. And Taylor did the capstone course. He lectured the capstone course at Harvard until he died. He was, every year he'd go back and he would lecture, give the capstone course. Okay, so he, he remains famous. Out of that period also came industrial engineering and industrial management. Because what's it called? Is he, the word scientific, oh my, I get off the term scientific management. Louis Brandeis is the guy that introduced, you know that? He was a Supreme Court justice. He introduced the term scientific management. Oh, I, I better not go off on that. 
But Lily and Gilbert helped him do it. Let's stay with this. I should read? Oh, no, no, no just that's just that. uh, <laughs> It takes too long to read. So, there were really three people that did this. It was the collaboration of the Gilbreths with Taylor. They became his close, well, some of his close, his inner circle were those two. They were construction management consultants. Frank, Frank was a, a brilliant bricklayer, a genius at bricklaying. He, even as an older guy, he, he would go on a job, he'd see a bricklayer, and he'd challenge him with a bet. I can lay bricks faster than you. And he could. He could beat any master bricklayer he ran into. He, he loved to do it because he was a genius at motions. He studied motions. He studied how they played baseball, you know, at the big parks in New York. He studied movies of baseball games to see how runners stole bases, how fast they would have to do, run to do it, how guys hit balls, how they fly balls. He, the guy was insane about the studying motions, okay? From bricklaying to everything he studied. He studied surgeons working in hospitals. He would put numbers on the surgeons, because they were all in white, and, and then follow all their motions, and the nurses. Well, there's no end to what Frank did. Lillian was his wife and his partner. Frank never finished his degree at, at MIT. He ended up building the biggest building at MIT at the time. The big, the big global labs were built by him in record time. But uh, Lillian got a PhD. She got, really got two PhDs. And he loved that. He boasted about her. She was the brains of the group, OK? And she was a full partner with him in running this consulting business. They discovered Frederick Taylor, and they were fascinated. And within a year, they were in really, you know, as close as you could get. Do you want me to go ahead to the Lillian Gilbert slides? Yeah. Oh, so you know what you skipped, did. You've skipped Owen and all of that stuff, New and all that. I'm sorry. She's pointing out my head myself. Do you want me to go to Lillian Gilbert? No, no, no. Let's go back. So I jumped ahead. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I skipped the Industrial Revolution. How should I? <laughs> so, okay, now we'll go back to the Industrial Revolution. Robert Owens, why now? We're doing Robert Owens. Okay. The big, a big prelim to the Gilbreths, I got off on that ahead of time, is the Industrial Revolution. It really is the sensational event in history that introduced IE to the world. Because in the Industrial Revolution, and in Manchester, England specifically, they invented the factory. A guy named Richard Arkwright, a brilliant guy, made a fortune out of it, but he was brilliant, built the first real factories to process textile. Okay? He processed American cotton there in Manchester. Well, now, Owen, how about Arkwright? Can you go back one? Arkwright was a little bit together. You don't have an arc right slide. You don't have an arc right slide. We're off. Okay, one more. No, no. But one more is Taylor. What happened to it? <laughs> well, we lost it. Okay, never mind. This is the mill that Arc Wright built. He built it in New Lanark, Scotland. And if you want to know, if you want to experience the Industrial Revolution, go there. It's a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. They preserved, not only preserved, but you could actually see Arkwright's mills running and processing textiles there. It's, it's fantastic. The other thing, the owner of that mill is Robert Owen. And Robert Owen was another eccentric, in a way, genius. He designed the mill town there, the factory town, for 2,500 workers, who he recruited in the poorhouses of Glasgow and, and Edinburgh. Okay. He brought him there. This is out in the boonies, really, in Scotland, to his mill. It's still on the River Clyde there, because that was the fastest, the most powerful part of the Clyde. And they used the Clyde to power the mill. OK, that's what's going on here. But Owen designed this town in a spectacular way. He was really one of the founders of British socialism. He was in Parliament. He argued to put in labor laws. He defended unions. He preached the value of unions. He was trying to make it 
how workers worked a practical thing. And he was really dedicated to this. So he tried to create at, at New Lenark the model factory town. He built the first school for factory children, 500 of them. He developed the curriculum, everything about it, because he wanted them to be properly educated, okay? <laughs> their kids, their dads were in the courthouse and, and brought there. Well, people from all over Europe went there, royalty, to see this. It was such a sensational experience. experiment, okay? Well, suddenly New Owen sells New Lodark. And he moves to Indiana, would you believe it, here. Because he says, I'm going to build the, uh, the ultimate, the ultimate town, uh, the ultimate community, worker community, on the Ohio River at New Harmony. Okay, he buys up this abandoned uh, Christian settlement, really, at New Harmony. And he's going to build this, this is what he's going to build in New Harmony. He took this plan, this design, to Congress and he showed it to a joint session of Congress what he was going to do. There were two presidents there, by the way, and he uh, explained to them what he was going to do. It was going to be a place where people worked and also did other things. It really was a... Thomas Moore wrote a book called Utopia, okay, in about 1500, and Moore, what was it, 1500 he wrote it, uh, in his, he talked about this model community, utopia, we use the word that way now, in which people worked half a day. And then they did scholarship, art, creative things the other half of the day. So they divided their time that way. That was his, his utopia. Okay? Owen thought he was going to build that, realize it, in Indiana on the Ohio River at New Harmony. He attracted 1,000 people to come who wanted to be these scholar workers. They dreamers too. Well, the whole thing fell apart. It was unrealistic. He had no way, he didn't know how to manage it. People were robbing him blind. He finally gave up and went back to England and just ditched the whole thing. But he left his family here. For some reason, his family stayed while he went to England. One son, his oldest son, became a congressman, a U.S. congressman, actually an ambassador to Italy eventually, and the guy who founded the Smithsonian Institute was Robert. Richard, his youngest son, became a professor of geology at Indiana University. He was also in the Civil War. He was a, a rather famous colonel there for his enlightened ways of soldiering. But anyway, uh, Richard is also the first president of Purdue University. Isn't that interesting? The first president here was Richard Owen, the son of Robert Owen, this dreamer from Scotland. Okay. We're there. What do we do next? Uh, drink some water. Drink some water. Okay. And then, What's uh, the next slide? Eli Whitney, the Colt Armory. Colt Armory in New Haven. New Haven. Eli Whitney. It ends. All right. Eli, here we go. The Industrial Revolution in England happened at the same time as the political revolution here. Okay. Very much the dates are the same. And it was a very costly war. America was almost bankrupt from that war. It recovered because of one guy, really, mostly this guy, Eli Whitney, a great inventor. He invented, for example, the cotton gin, which was remarkable. Southern planters could not sell their cotton in England because of seeds and everything in it. His gin removed the seeds, made it possible that they could sell cotton there, and they did. It swept right through the South, okay? But Whitney almost went bankrupt himself trying to defend the patent. He couldn't. Everybody imitated it everywhere. He lost his shirt in it, okay? Telling, getting lawyers to try to defend him. Anyway, to recover, he took a contract with the US government to build guns. And he invented a system, a factory system, of making guns, mass producing them, okay, for the US Army. It was very, it was a sensational thing. I mean, they imitated it all over the world. Guns, I mean, they were all made by gunsmiths before, handmade. 
Suddenly they're being made in a factory by inexperienced workers working with his mills to, to make these guns with interchangeable parts even. They could repair them right in the field. It was a sensation. Okay, but the big thing was that suddenly there was a, a really a tsunami of manufacturing all over the country. They manufactured bikes. They did everything mass produced the way following Whitney's model. Okay, it was tremendous. And America suddenly became a powerhouse in industry. America celebrated its centennial in Philadelphia in 1876. World's Fair, the first World's Fair. And the theme there, by the way, uh, the theme there was America's industry. And electricity had just come in. That President Grant oh, opened, opened the fair by starting these huge generators, you know, these coalesce steam generators to, to generate enough electricity to light the city of Philadelphia and the fair. So they turned on all the lights, you know, instantly. It's a sensational opening. It was Grant who did it. That's how much America was proud of industry. And it really came from Eli Whitney, who <laughs> began all this. Okay. But something else happened at that fair. At the fair, what came to head was this, that America was struggling how to keep this leadership. How do you find industrial leaders and train them? huge controversy, nobody knew how. In 1850, yeah, uh, the president of Brown University uh, wrote a paper saying, the only place you can study how to make a railroad is at West Point. No other college teaches this subject. So he said, we should teach engineering in college. And he wanted to teach it at Brown, but the faculty said, nothing to it. They voted it out. They weren't going to teach that technology stuff, how to build a railroad bridge or something like this. So, but in 1862, right, Congress passed a law, the Land Grant Law Act, to build an engineering school in every state in the Union. Okay? It, it took a long time to build them. Twenty years later, there were only 20 such schools, and everybody debated what they were teaching you know, technology, low-level stuff. The scientists would look down their noses at it. Anyhow, everybody argued about this is no way to teach any young man. And a leader, no. And so it went on. It also caused big battles over the money. I mean, for example, Harvard and MIT fought tooth and nail for that money. Because they wanted that, that federal money. And here in Indiana, Purdue and IU started a few that went on forever, pretty much, fighting over that money. Who was going to get it? Okay. The president of MIT, a guy named John Rumpel, there he is, a mathematician, really, but he, and turned to Harvard. He had a heart attack, apparently, because of his battle with Harvard, they say. But anyway, this is before that. He went to that fair in Philadelphia because the Russian exposition there was going to teach how they demonstrated how they teach design in the Moscow Technical School. That was one of the things that, that was the thing I guess Russia brought to the fair. And he went to see the demonstration. He was so impressed, he rushed back to MIT and changed the plan of study to follow the Russian model. Okay? And, well, that's what he did. Don't we have any? We have anything with Michael Golden Labs. In, okay. In drawing and well, models. what happened was he went back and, and changed MIT's way of teaching engineering, it turned out to be, following the Russian model. At about the same time, Purdue was being established. And John Purdue had finally convinced the legislature that he would put up the money if they would build that technical school, that engineering school, in Lafayette. And the legislator went along. It took a long time to finally get it going. They started building 1860, let's see, 1870s, early 18, they finally, they finally recruited Richard uh, Owen to be the president, okay? And they started making, putting the buildings together, okay? But Owen quit after two years. 
he got so much flack about what he was doing there in that thing that he quit and went back to IU as a professor. The guy who replaced him only lasted one year. He had some serious illnesses and he quit. Finally they got this guy. Did you know we don't have him here? There's Richard Owen. Oh, that's early Purdue, but it's more like 1905 or 10 or something. By the way, that's University Hall here on the left. Okay, but we run a little out of sync. On my left. Michael Golden Lab. Well, yeah, you're left. Did you talk about Michael Golden Lab? Is this Well, that's getting out of me. What do we have next? Well, you you went you had this, and then Michael Golden Lab, and then oh, that's, okay, okay, we'll go to Michael Golden. <laughs> that's the next one. Up here. This is what what I got. What this new president did, what, he recruited teachers from MIT. He brought in a guy named William Goss, who graduated at MIT, and he established at Purdue the program they had at MIT. He called it Practical Mechanics. And I have a description. <coughs> oh, okay, we'll move ahead here. Okay, here it is. Is that it? Yeah, he described in the catalog this. See, it's 1879. This is what he described in the catalog, what he was doing in the school. He explained it. You see, he's Following, he said he was following the plan of the Imperial College there in Moscow. The Teaching one. students machine tool use. Read the last one. And he said it really is a better thing than apprenticeship. Very efficient the way they were doing it, you know, as educators. And how they did. Well, this was the, the sophomore course he's talking about. Because The freshman course was how to draw precise drawings, make precise drawings of objects, geometric objects. They would make models, you know, like a ball. Or, and the student had to make a precise drawing of that object. And they did it in these labs, huge labs, drawing labs. But it was thought at that time that drawing was a very good thing for college students to do. So every student at Purdue had to take drawing. Okay, the engineers ended up taking more courses in drawing because they had to really come up with these precise drawings. And then in the second year, they would go to, I think we have a little shot of it maybe, uh, to Goss's shop, machine shop. Well, I don't know about that. Hey. If, if you have it, it's... I guess we, I guess we took it away. Oh well, <laughs> anyway. Here, here, here it is. Here it is. Because Goss himself built that machine shop. It's up there now. Oh, there's Goss. Goss is over here on the left. And over on the right, by the way, is the guy who took Goss's place, Michael Golden. And Michael Golden Hall was named after Goss. Michael Golden Lab is named after, today is named after, after Golden, I'm sorry. Well, Goss actually had to physically build the shop, bring the tools in, and start this whole process, okay? But out of that grew the Department of Practical Mechanics, he called it which ended up being freshman engineering, what we know today, in a way, okay? And that's what it was. And it spread all over the country so that every land-grant school in engineering taught that program. And they used, they built these huge buildings, and that's why Purdue built the largest such building in America. And that is Michael Golden Hall. There, there's Michael Golden Hall in its grandeur. <laughs> and uh, at that time, Michael Golden was teaching there. They didn't call it Michael, they called it practical, the building, the practical mechanics building. But when Michael Golden died, uh, they named it after him, and it became Mike's Castle to everybody on campus. Okay? Well, if you work to that point. Okay. Golden Church. Oh, okay, let's, let's do that. Because that shows. Behind it are the labs, and alongside it there were the labs. And Golden, there's Golden. And this is Turner, who also came from MIT, who was a, a teacher of shop floor mechanics. He was famous for it. He, he ended up being the oldest person in the parade of Purdue faculty, by the way, at graduations. But Turner, and that's 
that's just kind of the lab. An MPL lab then, with belts and everything. Okay, and the students really had a sweat there. Okay, that's engineering and how it got started, and you see produced place in this. Okay, that's what I wanted to bring out. The, uh, Golden was a very colorful guy, but maybe we better skip that. We're running out of time here. Okay. Uh, this is too many here's two know. courses that were taught in Michael Golden Lab. There is Practical Mechanics 25 there, and here is IE 270. Okay. Taught in 1970, you say, by Moshe Barash. This was taught by Turner back in 1930, I think, that version. Uh, you can see the similarity in these courses. Okay. So you see the continuity from practical mechanics to industrial engineering. And it really is a kind of, in fact, the historian, Purdue's historian, Noel, I think I have it in there, do we? Oh, am I losing it? It's after that. Anyhow, he, he made the argument, he wrote the history of Purdue engineering, and in it he says, industrial engineering is a natural heir of practical mechanics. There's no question about it. He said, industrial engineering fulfilled what Goss had dreamed of doing in the new program, which, which absorbed these manufacturing courses from practical mechanics. So in 1955, that building became the headquarters of industrial engineering. Uh, it, was, it was no longer a department of practice. The courses that were, in fact, that were kept were courses now in industrial engineering. Okay, so that's how the continuity went. And so now you're getting into Taylor and Gilbert. Now, in order for that to happen, that, that transition. You've only got 10 more minutes. And we're done? That's what we Oh, you see that? I, I, I have twice as much to say. Well, listen, I've got to jump. Well, this is the nature of what I was going to say. It's in my book, so you can accept a little embellished here. But let me say. Uh, the reason this happened in 1955, this change, was Lillian Gilbreth. She, her, her husband died, Taylor died, she became the leader, the national leader of industrial engineering. And she was recognized this way, even though she was a woman, and the only woman in the field. But everybody recognized her as the leader. She came to Purdue as a professor in 1935, the dean, Dean Potter, Potter Library is named after, Dean Potter was a very close friend. And he had her come. And so together, the two of them devised a scheme. At first, they created a Department of General Engineering, which pulled together all the courses being taught of that kind. They pulled the, the practical mechanics courses in. They had a division of practical mechanics within it, general engineering. They pulled in courses that ME was teaching in business. because. Purdue couldn't have a business school, so to teach accounting, say, the engineers, ME taught them in ME. Well, probably didn't like, they, he pulled that all into this Department of General Engineering, and here's the course that Lillian taught in, in general engineering. Okay? And she called it industrial management, because for, in her view, management was a part of all of this. And it was always with her, it was industrial engineering and management. Okay, and she called her a course manager. Uh, and you see, it's IE is what it is. It was one of the most pop. It was the most popular course on campus. Okay, this this course. So that is how IE came to be established. It then became formally called industrial engineering. Right after Potter was succeeded by Dean Hawkins, Dean Hawkins changed it to industrial engineering and management, and then five years later, he split it into two schools, industrial engineering, industrial management. Okay, and that's how we came to be what we are. And so we're up there, and here's Lillian. The remarkable Lillian Gilbreth. I could spend an hour just talking about Lillian. She is so spectacular. I, I, I wish I had another hour to talk about it. How much time do we have left? Nothing. Are we over? You need to move ahead to, to the motion. Okay. Um, ten minutes. We'll just maybe go ten minutes. Let me, let me point out something about Lily. She, would, she retired in 1948, but would come back almost every other year. Followed a grand tour around the world. 
She had 23 honorary doctorates and 20 national awards from countries all over the world for what she did. Okay. Japan gave her this award. On her last visit in 1968, she came here and she had just gotten this award in Japan. This is the highest award given by Japan, usually given to royalty. They gave it to Lily. Keep moving. They did her. Keep moving. Now, there's a history of this. Back in uh, 1929, I think it is, Lillian went to Japan representing Herbert Hoover. It was a World Congress of Engineering. Hoover couldn't go. He asked Lillian to go and speak for him. He, she went because she knew people like this guy, Godo. Godo had taken her course in 1920 in industrial management, you call it. And he went back to Japan, developed a course that became quite famous. And he happened to say this, for example, he was the guy that developed the courses. Okay? Uh, he was the vice president of the Japan Management Association. After the war, oh, stop here. After the war, <laughs> the U.S. used the Japan to, to get Japanese industry going again. Okay? And Goto's courses became the key thing to educate people in Japan. Their greatest success was the Toyota production system. It came out of this. Okay? It emphasized worker loyalty and teamwork instead of intense automation in order to get outstanding productivity and quality. Okay. GM wanted to know what the heck was going on. They formed a, a partnership with Toyota to open this plant called Numi in Fremont, California and build Chevys and Toyotas on the same production line using Toyota's methods. Toyota wanted to see if they could do it in America. GM wanted to see how they did it. And that's what they did. And so for 10 years, they did this. Okay, this is the Numi workers in Fremont celebrating the first car to come off the line. These workers were fired by GM two years before because the Fremont plant was considered the worst plant in history, they said. The worst auto plant. And they fired all the workers and closed the plant. Very rare thing to do. When they opened Numi, they hired all those guys back, all those workers back. They really challenged, I guess, Japan, uh, Toyota. So, but it was very successful. They developed this huge camaraderie, you know, and loyalty from this group of workers. And Toyota went ahead and built six huge assembly plants in America. Okay, become one of the largest, what, world's largest producers. And GM. After 20 years, introduced what they called the GM Global System of Manufacturing, which is, incorporates an awful lot of Toyota's ideas are in that, in that new system. And it took GM 20 years to do it, to change. Uh, people say if they'd just done it a bit faster, they could have avoided that bankruptcy, the largest bankruptcy in American history, you know? But they didn't. It just dragged their feet. Finally, they did it. Okay. Now, now I wanted to talk about Moshe. My gosh, sorry. For, what about this stuff? So Moshe comes, this, this ME teaches these hard manufacturing courses, you know, represented here by uh, Diego Rivera and his great... Uh, but before long, but, but Moshe was in touch with everything going on in the world. He became fascinated with computer manufacturing systems integrated, okay? And suddenly, Moshe is into this kind of thing. Flexible machines, flexible systems that can make all kinds of parts, that use smart conveyors, smart material handling, smart tolling, smart everything, you know, in a huge smart network. This means you use a lot of computer science if you're going to do that, okay? A lot of modeling. So suddenly, Moshe is knee deep into systems modeling, okay? But he sees that's what's necessary. All right. He ends up creating, well, what happened was American industry was in, uh, terribly alarmed by Japanese 
and Chinese, especially manufacturing, that they were using all these new methods, but also that they had this cheap labor. So they came to Purdue and said, help us. President Hansen asked Dean Hancock, what can we do? And Hancock called this big meeting of all the engineering faculty. And Moshe stood up and described computer integrated manufacturing. It was adopted. We started the CIMAC program, computer aided, uh, what? Uh, design, CAD. It was CAD uh, automation from double E and manufacturing from IE. Okay? And it was this huge program, the biggest program, research program that Purdue ever mounted. Okay? Funded by National Science Foundation and funded by uh, many big corporations with huge multi million dollar grants. Okay? And Ray Moshe was the genius. There's a picture of, of the SIM lab, the CAD lab in, in MGL uh, using a flexible manufacturing system here. Okay. <clears throat> that project, I say, it happened in 1976, or 1970, it was really a little after that, but I date, again, you see, the third year of America, the third centennial of America begins then. Apple Computer was incorporated that year, okay? We started, had, we started this business uh, with, with, uh, we, what else happened that year? But I think really it began a whole new era of engineering. Because we're not, manufacturing is now all engineering, in a way, you see. It, you couldn't just talk about hard shop floor manufacturing. And that wasn't meaningful anymore. That was part of it. But we had to talk about everything else that went on with global manufacturing. So you see, he opened the doors to this huge chain of things. And industrial engineering sort of became manufacturing engineering. Manufacturing it became industrial engineering. The whole thing got blurred. What is this thing? You know? And not only that, but people started to, this is from Stewart Center, uh, people started to talk about industrializing things like hospitals. People didn't like that word industrial in a hospital, so they call it hospital engineering. But it was really industrial engineering done in hospitals. Okay? Somebody was industrializing all kinds of services. And, and people didn't like that. So they, they said, we have to call it something else. Let's call it systems engineering. That, that sounds softer, doesn't it? OK, but it was really industrial engineering. And that's what happened. We suddenly had all kinds of things. People like to use production engineering. But they were really talking about the same thing then, whatever they called it. Management engineering, it didn't matter. And so, the new thing we now call, uh, what we talk about science, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and management, it's one thing. They're all unified together in how to apply this, this science of, of work, really, how to develop work systems for the betterment of humankind. Now, do I have any, any more time left? You can almost slides. I don't know. This is I want to tell you how important that is. Work is something that humans have to do to survive. If we can do it better, it's better for humanity. That's my basic thesis. Okay. When the factory was in, the factory was invented in the Industrial Revolution and brought to America, especially by Whitney. The factory ended slavery. It was the power, the industrial power of the North that beat the South in the long run. Uh, Slavery was the ancient way of organizing work. Everywhere. The Civil War fought with factories in a way, put an end to it. Factory systems, the industrial systems that came out of that, defeated Hitler. Hitler thought America was no threat. They can't make anything over there, you know? They can't make the kind of things we can do in German manufacturing establishments. But he was wrong, okay? It was our factories that built a huge number of bombers and everything else, ships, Kaiser building ships, one a day, 
on the west coast that beat Japan, too. You see? It's, so, organizing work is a damn good thing. People complain about it. They say factories will what they do to people. Yeah, they took them out of, out of coal mines, for example. Now we're taking them out of coal mines and putting them into making solar panels. Much better thing to do, okay, in, in many ways. Well, you know, we have, we have the old Luddites who, who, who don't want to give up those old jobs. No way for the future to be that way. Anyway, it's that theme. That is the big theme that we see going on. And that's the theme that Lillian pushed and that Moshe pushed. And so I just want to draw that parallel and say how Moshe is a modern Lillian in a way. Now Lillian, Lillian and Frank knew what they were doing. They called themselves quest makers because they said they were like ancient explorers who didn't quite know where they were going, but they were committed to it. They were going to do it no matter what, even if it was foolish what they did. And they knew that they were doing the same thing in trying to find what they called the one best way to do work. They called, it, they called themselves the one best marriage, for example. But they, <laughs> that's the kind of people they were frequently devoted to that kind of quest. And they said amongst themselves, she wrote a book about this, that they knew they didn't know what the goal, the final goal looked like. So they didn't know how to measure their progress. They weren't even, there wasn't a road map. They didn't even know where they were going in the right direction. But they kept looking at the next generation and saying, are we having a good effect on them? And she said, that's the only measure we can have, is that, okay? Keep moving ahead and seeing the effect it is. And that's what guided them. Now, I just think Moshe fits that pattern. You see, he did it for us in our, in our generation. She did it for them, for us too, back then. So maybe that's enough said. That's, that's the main theme. Okay. <laughs> back at uh, in Grissom Hall in the, in the student center uh, immediately following so as soon as you can get over there you're all welcome and uh, we do have a, uh, a nice gift for Dr. Lankuler that I think was, uh, was really beautiful wow. it's a globe with a with an inscription hey global global manufacturing you see <laughs> <laughs> We're all about it. <laughs>